chair of the density committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04 and its extensions, the public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. In accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that, one, we are providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possible by video and other electronic means. We are utilizing Zoom for the video and other electronic uh, uh, all for this electronic meeting. All members of the committee and selected legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously in this meeting through this platform. And the public has access to the contemporaneously watch and or listen to the meeting on Zoom, YouTube, etc., and via phone by following the directions and links provided on the general court website. We have provided public notice of the necessary information for assessing the meeting in the Senate calendar. And we are providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access. If anyone has a problem, please email at remotesenate at ledge.state.nh.us or call 603-271-3043. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. And finally, we'll start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please state also where they are and if anyone else in the room with you is dur during this meeting which is required under the right to know law. I will call the roll. I hope. Senator, if it's easier, I, I could call the roll. That would be great. Thanks, Ben. Okay, um, looking for, and I'll just confirm we do have a quorum. Uh, Matt Leahy. Hi, this is Matt Leahy with the Four Society. I am alone in my office in Concord. Andrew Haddock. <clears throat> Andrew Haddock, uh, NHMA. Uh, Representative Bolio. Uh, here, and I'm here at home uh, by myself in Manchester. Chris Nato. Chris Nato, I'm here at my office in Concord alone. Noah Hodgetts. You're muted, Noah. My apologies, Noah Hodgetts. Uh, I'm here in my office at home alone in Congress. Keith Tebow. I'm here in my office in Keene alone. Sylvia Von Aulach. Morning, everyone. Sylvia Von Aulach. I'm in my dining room <laughs> at home in New Ham in Newmarket, and I am also alone. Um, and I see Jen Sis is also here connecting to audio. Uh, we'll come back to you, Jen. I'm Ben Frost. I'm at my home in Warner. Uh, my wife is downstairs. Uh, Senator Fuller-Clark. Uh, Senator Martha Fuller-Clark, I am at my office in York, Maine, and I am ostensibly alone, though someone may be wandering through. Thank you. Jen says. Good morning, Jen says. Stratford Regional Planning Commission. Sorry, I had a little uh, locking myself and an employee out of the office moment here this morning, so. Uh, <laughs> here a couple minutes late, but all good. And so, uh, Jan, you and Sylvia will have to fight over who votes for the RPCs. Um, no and, problem. Uh, I'll uh, leave it to Jen. I'm sort of on the side today. Okay, we will recognize Jen as representing the RPCs. Um, Representative Penicetti, I don't see Representative Dolan here. Are you uh, the representing? Are you the other member of the House? Uh, for the purposes I am. of today? I will okay. be that way if, if Senator Clark wants me to be, yes. Okay, th then can you um, indicate uh, uh, whether you're with anyone? Reed Panacetti, I am in Amherst. I am in my office alone. Great, thank you. Uh, I think that is everyone who has tuned in uh, at this time, Senator.
Uh, great. Uh, and then, um, do we have to record any guests? Uh, no. We certainly can. Uh, uh, I just note that uh, Lorraine Merrill is here. Uh, you don't have to tell us whether you're with anyone because you're not a member of the, the commission. Um, and we're, we're expecting uh, Cordell Johnston from the Municipal Association um, uh, to be presenting as well. And he is here. Okay, great. Thank you, Alan. And Alan Raff and Jenny Horgan, um, Senate staff. Great. Uh, thank you all very much um, for attending today. And I want to thank our presenters. And I think we could just um, begin. I just promoted so I, now for you guys. So he is now able to speak if you have questions for him. And so, Senator, you want uh, Cordell to present first? Sure, that would be great. So sorry, we just need to review the minutes for Senator from the previous. Oh, meeting. oh yes. Um, the minutes, thank you very much for reminding me. Um, uh, we need to have a vote on the minutes from last week. Um, if there's a motion to approve the minutes. Andrew Haddock moved. Thank you very much, Andrew. Is there a second? No, Hodgett, second. Thank you very much. Are there any changes, amendments, corrections, additions? See, seeing none, um, I will call for the vote and it has to be by roll call. Uh, let's see, Matt Leahy. Um, I was not at the meeting last week. Do I need to abstain from taking a vote or does that, is that an issue? I, if not, then I vote yes. It's, it's, it's a choice. You. Yeah, it's up to you, Matt. I, I will vote yes. They, I, I looked them through and they seem quite thorough, so. Andrew Haddock. Andrew Haddock, aye. Representative Bolio. Aye. Chris Neto. Aye. Noah well, Hodgetts. Aye. Keith Tebow. Aye. Uh, Jen says. Aye. Uh, ben Frost votes aye. And Senator. I vote aye. Carries unanimously. Now it will be time for Cordell Johnson. Uh, and Cordell, I, I believe you know what sort of the role of um, this commission has been. And we're interested to hear from you about uh, the role that the Municipal Association um, has been playing, might be playing in terms of looking at, in particular, at uh, zoning issues um, that may provide barriers uh, to greater density in our communities throughout the state. But I'm sure that you have other comments to add as well. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, <clears throat> you're welcome, thank you, and good morning to everybody. Uh, I'm not going to ask whether you can hear me. I'm just going to keep talking and someone will let me know if you can. Uh, so um, I'm, uh, I'm pleased to be here with you this morning. I have been uh, attending most of your meetings, although you can't <clears throat> all that, but I've been listening. Um, and uh, I... I <laughs> I heard uh, Elliot a couple of weeks ago say that he'd like to hear from hear from us about whether there's a ray of hope uh, from <laughs> from our perspective, and I I guess I think there are there are some rays of hope, uh, but there's you know there's some foliage that that you need to get through, and I don't I'll tell you right from the beginning I don't have any brilliant ideas. I don't have solutions to, to this problem. Um, I do have some thoughts. Um, <clears throat> I know that, that municipalities and, and uh, in particular, the Municipal Association sometimes are perceived as being obstacles to uh, housing development and, and in particular uh, affordable housing development. We don't want to be, um, but 
the you know the reality is we are we're a membership organization, and um, we represent we represent all the cities and towns in New Hampshire, and that's a whole lot of people with a whole lot of different uh, perspectives, and uh, and we don't control them. Uh, in fact, they control us. So uh, we you know we try as much as we can to sort of lead from behind and gently nudge people along. Um, and as I think, I think you all understand, there are um, plenty of municipalities that are doing, uh, that, are, that are trying. Um, others that are not, perhaps not trying quite so hard. Um, and you know, ideally we would have everybody rowing in the same direction. Um, one of the, what, actually before I go any further, let me, I think I can do this. I, I, I'd like to share my screen with you. This, I'm gonna share um, the, this is a section of NHMA's legislative policies that we just adopted at our policy conference um, a week and a half ago. Uh, doesn't seem to be happening. Oh wait, there we go. Okay, so I, I hope you can see that now. And we, we have adopted a, a, a policy on housing uh, which includes uh, sort of a broad statement of um, our policy and then several bullet points. And uh, frankly, that the, the broad statement is kind of uh, vague and sort of, um, sort of feel good, but it does express our interest in, um, in uh, helping to provide uh, diverse and affordable housing while still trying to maintain some, le some level of local control. And then uh, I'm not going to go through the bullet points, but you can uh, read those as, as you want. Um, and again, as I say, we're trying to make clear that we think that uh, housing and, and affordable housing are needs and we want to um, help get there. Um, but still, uh, we do believe that municipal, municipalities should have some level of control. Um, <clears throat> in thinking about different municipalities, and I, and I, I, heard, I don't remember, remember whether it was last week or two weeks ago, but someone, I think it was Noah, was talking about municipalities that had recently uh, adopted zoning amendments uh, that would would help with the development of more uh, housing and more affordable housing. And uh, some other municipalities that had gone the other direction. And one of the, one of the issues is, uh, as I recall, the, the ones that, had, that were going in the more progressive direction were all either cities or towns that have a town council. And the ones that were going the other way were not, they were towns. And so I, uh, one of the problems is, and in a, in a city, and this, I'm not sure this is true across the board, but in general, in a city, zoning ordinances are adopted and amended by the city council. Um, in a town that has a town council like Londonderry, which has been held up as an example of a town that's doing good work, it's the town council that adopts and amends the zoning ordinance. They're not, uh, they're not voted on by the town meeting. Um, <clears throat> so I think if you have a city or a town where, it's, where there's the, the, uh, the council that is voting on these things, if you can educate your town officials, you have a much better chance of adopting the policies that you're looking to adopt. If you're talking about most of the towns in New Hampshire where ordinances are adopted and amended by the, by the town meeting, 
Um, and someone was talking about uh, social media campaigns that start and everyone, you know, it's sort of a sort of a mob revolt um, to either reject reject proposed amendments or to uh, repeal existing uh, provisions that al allow for better development. It's just a lot harder to get the message out to the entire population of the town than it is to uh, your planning board and your town or city council. So that that's one of the obstacles that we face. Um, education of, of local governing bodies and local land use boards is good, but but there needs to be somehow more education for, for everyone. And as I said, I don't have any brilliant ideas for how to accomplish that. Um, there are, I know I'm not telling you anything new here, uh, but as I've been thinking about it, there are two common objections or concerns that people have when, when someone starts talking about more housing in a municipality. One is, what's it gonna cost me as a taxpayer? And two is, um, not in my backyard. I, I have no idea how to solve the second problem. I, I, I'm, I'm not even sure it is possible. Um, there, there are some things that we can do on the first problem. One is, and I know you've talked about this at the last couple of meetings. One is education about uh, dispelling some of the myths about the costs that more housing will bring to your town. Um, someone was talking last, I think it was last week about Merrimack and a, a, a proposal that they have uh, and concern there that's gonna bring more kids into our schools. Uh, not taking into account the fact that the schools apparently already are, um, uh, have a lot of excess capacity because of the declining school population. And so, and I am by no means an expert on any of that, but to the extent that there <clears throat> is information that can get out there to try to dispel some of the myths about the cost uh, of, of housing, that's something that that uh, the more that can be done, the better. Um, and then there, and, 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 and that education needs to be both for local officials, uh, land use board members, governing body members, and for the general public. Um, while I'm, before I go any further, I'm gonna scroll up here or scroll down here so you can see our policy that we also adopted on land use uh, obviously somewhat related. Um, then uh, apart from that and still sticking with the issue of costs and just the economics generally, um, there, are, there are things that ideally can be done, but they involve money. And, and uh, largely they involve state money and, and we all know about the problems with that. Um, and some of, some of these, uh, Andrew covered in his presentation that was distributed a couple of weeks ago, but uh, the first one obvious that everyone has talked about is more funding for the regional planning commissions. Um, they provide extremely important technical assistance to local land use boards where they can provide that if they have the capacity and the resources to do so. Um, and I, you know, I, I know uh, Sylvia and Jen are here um, uh, and you're all familiar with the, with the funding issues uh, with RPCs, there, there needs to be more of it. And I think, I think we all pretty much agree on that. Um, then there's the issue of infrastructure. Uh, obviously, if there is more um, community water and sewer uh, and other infrastructure available, that makes uh, housing more available um, or makes 
it makes it easier to accommodate more housing and more densely developed housing. Um, but again, infrastructure costs money to the extent that municipalities can get um, uh, assistance from somewhere uh, and the most obvious place is the state, but wherever can get financial assistance for infrastructure, that, that is helpful. Uh, possibly other incentives, House Bill 1632 from last year contained uh, a number of incentives, uh, both for municipalities and for developers. Um, you know, when, when people blame, uh, blame municipalities for getting in the way Historically, I'd like to say, well, if the if the developers would just build, uh, you know, um, more affordable housing, we wouldn't have the problem. But but I, I I've come around to recognize that actually maybe they have some costs too that they need to cover, uh, and it's not as easy as saying we'll just just build less expensive houses less expensive houses. I, I know that I know that uh, they have issues as well as we do. Um, so, and, and, you know, House Bill 62, I thought was a good idea. That, uh, you know, I'm, I'm skeptical that it's going to provide a whole lot of uh, assistance, but it's certainly a step in the right direction. Um, and if there's more, if there's more that can be done, if, if people have other ideas for uh, better and stronger incentives, we're all on board with that. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, when, when the state <clears throat> wanted to encourage uh, municipalities to uh, clean up the water by building um, wastewater treatment facilities, the state agreed that it would pay part of the expense and we have the state aid grant program to, to deal with that. Um, that's the kind of thing uh, that, I, that I think if there were something like that uh, for, for housing, that would be, um, that would be wonderful. I recognize it's, it's not the municipality that is responsible for, for building um, housing as it is a wastewater treatment facility, but, but uh, programs like that, I think uh, anything that, that we can do would be, uh, would be a step in the right direction. And then as a, a much broader, uh, a much broader issue is state tax policy in general. And I, that's certainly not the, the uh, charge of this commission, but when people hear about a, you know, a 200 housing development coming to town, their first, uh, other than the not in my backyard issue, the, the first response I have is, well, how much is this gonna cost in, in uh, school expenses and how much are our taxes gonna go up? And uh, whether that's an issue or not, or whether, whether that really will increase those costs, people believe that it will. And largely that's because um, education is funded almost exclusively by local property taxes. Um, <clears throat> I am clearly not here to advocate for a major change in New Hampshire's tax system, but obviously that fact is something that weighs heavily on people's minds and plays into any discussion about, um, about housing development. And so uh, with that, I, that, that's all I have to say. And as I told you at the beginning, beginning I don't have any great solutions for you. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen now. And uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Yeah, Cordell, this is Representative Bowyer. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Um, the uh, the um, New Hampshire Municipal Association uh, supports or uh, opposes. Now you represent the municipality. So is this coming from the municipalities or is this coming from your organization? What you suppose, what you support, what you oppose? 
Yeah, this is well, it's coming from our organization on behalf of the municipalities and uh, to give you a, a one minute review of our legislative policy process. Um, our legislative policies uh, start with proposals that are submitted by our member municipalities. And then we, uh, every, every two years, we assemble three committees, three legislative policy it's committees. Nine o'clock. To review um, the policies that we have had for the last two years and any new proposals and to pr propose, and, and it's really, it's very much like a legislature or like a, or like a town meeting that those committees review, uh, review the proposals and then make recommendations um, for what our policies ought to be forward. And the legislative policy committees consist entirely of local officials, um, selectmen, town managers, aldermen, planning board members, et cetera. And then they go to our legislative policy conference where all of our member municipalities are invited and they vote on the policies. So these have been adopted by representatives of the municipalities. I, I think uh, Ben can shake his head if I'm wrong, but I think Ben was on our, one of our legislative policy committees this year uh, as uh, chairman of the planning board in Warner. Um, so that, that's a brief uh, explanation of our policy process and, and how we get these policies. I have another question. I don't know if it's, it should be directed to you, but developers uh, in the state, large develop, developers, are they accessing federal funding for, ho for housing currently? Do you know that might be something for Ben? But that, that's, that's more for Ben or, or someone else. All right. Okay, thanks, Cordell. Um, I wonder if there are other members um, of the commission that have questions for Cordell and uh, if so, this now would be the time and then I have some questions. Senator, I'd like to ask uh, Cordell a question. Sure. Um, hi, Cordell. I, at first, I, as you're right, I, I represent my town on one of the, the committees in the, the policy making process and I find it to be a, a stimulating and robust process. Uh, the, the debate is really good um, and I appreciate the work that NHMA staff uh, puts into it. Second, I, I've been doing you know advocacy for affordable housing for the better part of 20 years and I just for the record I have always found the staff of the Municipal Association to be uh, really thoughtful um, and accommodating to compromise. Uh, so we don't always agree, but we seem to usually be able to find some sort of middle ground. And I, I think, you know, the, the, the work that you do balancing your, uh, the municipal interests as espoused by the policy positions taken by the delegates uh, to your uh, biennial uh, conference, if you will, um, against what you know, what the law says. Um, I think uh, I think you do very artfully and deftly, and I really appreciate uh, the efforts you make. Um, the The question I have for you is: You mentioned House Bill sixteen thirty two. Uh, there was a companion bill, House Bill sixteen twenty nine, which uh, dealt with um, more process issues at the local level, such as requirements of findings of fact, timelines. Uh, could you comment on that, please? That bill. Yeah, uh, 1629, th there was a whole lot in that, uh, some of which we didn't like. And uh, you'll recall the, the thing that we disliked the most was the uh, mandatory training for land use board members. And, uh, and that, was, that was taken out. Um, there, were, there were some other things um, that we had some minor concerns with and uh, to be honest, I haven't gone back and looked at it uh, recently, but uh, we, as you know, we, we uh, met with the subcommittee of municipal and county government and worked uh, over several sessions on that bill and came up with something that we, that we were, we could live with. Um, and uh, you know, it, it imposes some tighter restrictions on local land use boards uh, but they're, they're not unreasonable. A lot of them are things that they should be doing anyway. Uh, so 
I, I guess uh, don't don't uh, don't hold me one hundred percent to this, but my recollection is that as it came out of the committee, um, we were we were okay with House Bill sixteen twenty nine. Question, if I could. Yes, Sylvia. Uh, thank you, um, Cordell. I'm wondering. You've you've seen a lot of pol. What well, this whole group has talked about everything you've mentioned today, um, every aspect of it. And I'm wondering, having seen uh, probably a lot of different policies um, in your career, what do you think? Is it that we're not packaging? Uh, some of our policies in a way that's acceptable? Is it the use of the words affordable housing or workforce housing? Does it need to be packaged differently? Or what do you think is the, the, um, the hiccup that continually happens and stops legislation from moving forward into a more innovative uh, direction? I'm not, uh, I guess I'm not sure that the problem is with legislation. Um, I mean, the, uh, the, uh, as far as legislation goes, uh, we passed the, you know, the workforce housing statute back has now been a long time, time ago, about 12 years ago, I guess, um, the ADU statute, uh, five or six, four or five years ago, you know, as Ben said, um, we didn't always agree, but we, we were able to come up with things that we thought worked. Um, uh, and then, and then there's House Bill 1629 and 1632, which died because of COVID-19, not for any other reason, as far as I know. Um, so I, I don't think, I mean, getting legislation through is a slow process. I don't think that's been the problem, I think, and I, you know, I say this kind of quietly, I think the, the, the problems exist more at the local level and getting people to understand and follow the law and, um, and as I, you know, as I've said several times, not just local officials, but uh, the, the voters who often control the final decision. And it's a matter of, it's a matter of education, and yeah, as I said, you know, if 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 we got uh, if New Hampshire Housing or New Hampshire Municipal Association or someone got a ten billion dollar grant to solve to address this, then I think the problem would be solved. Um, so, but I don't see that coming, unfortunately. Uh, Jane, you had an additional question. Yeah. Um, I know I participated in a lot of those hearings for 1635 and 1629. The mandatory training, that's the key. And it's amazing how people just do not want to be educated or told that they need to be educated. And that is the problem. So I don't know how to resolve that, but you know, it's unfortunate that that did not end up in the final bill because I think that's the, that's the most important part of the bill. I'm sure you probably agree. Oh, no, I disagree. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but no, that, that was the one piece that we really, that we really uh, disagreed with uh, because um, education, education is an issue, but um, uh, simply requiring land use our view is it's simply requiring land use board members to take a few hours of training every year. Um, first of all, it's, uh, it, it looks like an unfunded mandate. Second, it's, um, it, it's it, 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 if people see that simply as an obligation, oh, I have to take my three hours of training and be done with it, they're going to they're gonna do that and it's probably not going to change their minds anyway. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't want to I don't want to have too much time here, but that, <laughs> unfortunately, that is the one part that we that we could not support. Jane, do you have anything you want to add? 
Okay, I have, um, is there anyone else who has questions? Okay. Cordell, I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, one is just a comment to ask you if you could um, share the screens that you posted so we can include them um, in the report. That would be very helpful. Uh, the second question that I have is, uh, what is your relationship and how do you work with the regional planning commissions? Uh, when, when you say, how do we work with the regional planning commissions? Do you mean NHMA or do you mean the municipalities? I mean, MHA, NHMA. Uh, okay. I mean, we don't, we don't have a formal relationship with the RPCs, but we are, we're in frequent communication with them. Um, you know, we do, uh, uh, they do things at our annual conference. We work with them on things at the OSI conferences. Um, and our members obviously are, our, our members are their members. So we're, you know, we're working in tandem as I said, not not any official relationship, but uh, in tandem and pretty well parallel on, on the things that we that we both have in common. So just to follow up on that a little bit, um, since there are two issues here: is one is um, more financial support for the RPCs, but two, if we come to the overarching issue, which is education of the um, local residents, uh, who's, who should be trying to, to do that? Um, and how can we do a better job um, at uh, perhaps succeeding in changing perceptions? And a follow-up question is, what's going on in other states that perhaps we could learn from around the issue of workforce housing, affordable housing, low income housing, all those different housing needs that we have? Uh, as far as other states, I don't, I, I, I don't have detailed knowledge. I know that uh, some of them have more aggressive laws about um, development of uh, workforce housing, affordable housing. I, I, I don't know details. Um, I do, I mean, I, I just have a general sense that New Hampshire is certainly not the only, uh, the only place in the country or even in uh, the New England region that has these kinds of issues. Uh, but other than that, I-, I and, and hopefully Ben can help us with that as well. But then the right. other- question is just uh, educating of the larger public. And I, I don't know, I mean, lo local officials can, can help with that. Um, but there, you know, there needs to be, there needs to be an incentive to do it. Um, I I, I don't have any great ideas. <laughs> so, so, so when you offer your various training sessions for local officials, yep. um, do, do you offer anything that um, directly addresses the housing issues? Uh, yeah, I mean, we don't have a, <clears throat> we don't have a specific or a regular program devoted to housing issues. Uh, but we do uh, pretty regularly have sessions at our annual conference. And we also have, we started um, last year, I think was the first year doing an annual um, uh, land use con conference in cooperation with OSI. Uh, and we actually have that conference uh, coming up October 30th or 31st, whatever that Saturday is. And there are, uh, I believe, some uh, some sessions dealing with housing um, at that conference. So, and, and I mean, historically, we uh, we did what we called our law lecture series in the fall every year, 
which dealt with land use issues. And frequently there were uh, that dealt with, uh, or some of those dealt with housing issues. That's now been collapsed into our fall land use conference. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not a, it's not a regular, you know, routine series of programs on housing, but it does come up frequently in our sessions at, at those conferences and some other, some other sessions as well. Do you think it would be useful to have a commitment that the Municipal Association plays a role every year in, um, with the training that you provide to local municipal officials, um, a, a segment on housing? That it's I, not just something that comes up, but it's conscious effort on behalf of the Municipal Association? Yeah, I, um, although I'm, I'm, not, I'm not authorized to commit to that, I think that's a good idea and I'd be happy to take that back to uh, those who, who are in a position. Okay. Uh, I mean, this issue is not gonna go away. So I right. think um, the more focused discussion there can be by um, entities that are really dealing directly with municipalities, um, on, a, on an ongoing basis um, could be helpful. Yeah, I, I, I certainly agree. And I think uh, I'd be happy to talk to my colleagues about that. Great, thank you. Uh, are there other questions, comments, concerns um, to raise with Cordell? Senator, yes, I saw sir. that uh, Representative Dolan had a question, but before he does that, we have two members who have joined the meeting, uh, Representative Dolan and uh, Mark LaLiberty. Uh, if you, Representative Dolan, could you um, tell us where you are and who you're with? Um, hi, this is uh, Tom Dolan. I am alone in Londonderry. And Mark? Mark LaLiberty filling in for Chris Way. I am alone at my house in Candia. Great, thank you. Thank you. Senator, this is uh, Representative Tom Dolan. I, I'm, I'm on the committee, uh, municipal committee, that uh, heard those two bills. And I just, just uh, as my memory serves me, those bills came out of committee uh, with bipartisan support. And they went to the House floor, and I believe the House voted in favor of them. I did the PI on one of them. And from there, I'm not sure if, if it went to the Senate and was confirmed there, but I believe my behind the curtain information tells me the governor was uh, in a position that he was uh, going to support those two bills. So I, I believe it was only the, the virus that uh, stopped them. There wasn't anything else. We, we, uh, we did modify the legislation a little bit and took out, as Cordell said, the mandatory training. And we kind of got stuck on the fact that, that if, some, if, if the training was mandatory, then we would end up with a, a variety of situations where planning boards would have some people trained and some people not trained and those people not trained would have to recuse themselves. It was, it got kind of messy as we looked through the, the various scenarios that would play out. So, th so that, that's one of the reasons why the training, mandatory training requirement came out. But I, I think that, uh, I echo some of the folks that just spoke about the, the value of the training and the, the education of the, uh, of the policymakers, but uh, we, we couldn't get past the, uh, the mandatory piece of it. But again, uh, I don't think there's any, you know, we're talking about what do we need to do to get this passed? I think all, all the skids were appropriately greased and I think it was on a, on a uh, okay to pass uh, pathway uh, and it just, it just, we just got struck uh, by the virus and that shut everything down. Right. It, it never came over um, to be acted upon by the Senate due to COVID. So it was part of those many house bills um, that died, if you wish, um, because of COVID. And I would hope that uh, those bills can be reintroduced and uh, maybe uh, the discussion might be, do you want to start them in the Senate um, this time around um, since uh, the Senate never had a chance to, to hear them and, and, then, and then perhaps 
then send them over to the house. Uh, but I, I don't believe that there's, they're going to run into um, huge opposition from the conversations that were previously held in the Senate. So anyway, that's, that's something going forward that perhaps you know, could be part of our recommendations that those bills be refiled. And I'd be interested to know if, if there's a preference that they be refiled in the House or the Senate. Senator, I, 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 I think, go, go ahead, I, go ahead, Ben, I'm sorry. Right, thank you, Representative Dolan. I, I have spoken with um, Representative Willis Griffith, uh, who is the prime sponsor of one of the bills and a co-sponsor on the other. Um, he does plan to, if he's reelected, uh, to uh, be the prime on both of them uh, in the House next year. Okay. Um, so maybe given that they had a, a fairly full hearing, they could be moved somewhat expeditiously through the House and then come to the Senate. But that's good news. Thank you, Ben. Um, and I don't know um, if there are other... Um, housing initiatives that will come forward, but certainly that needs to be, be tracked. Um, and I think it's very helpful that perhaps the Municipal Association may uh, help with a bill that will be filed to increase funding for the RPCs, because I think that's so essential in so many ways. Uh, ben, before we move on, um, are you able to perhaps not today, but maybe next week, um, give us some insight into how other states are dealing with this issue, because we're certainly not alone. I'd be happy to. Okay, that, that would be great. Uh, are there further questions for Cordell? Cordell, thank you so very much, and thank you for being an attentive um, observer, participant, um, if, if not a member um, of the commission for uh, uh, tracking and listening to all that's gone on with the work of this commission over the last year, year and a half. So thank you. You're welcome and thank you for doing the work. Great. Okay, and now we're to hear from Lorraine. Is that correct, Ben? I wonder before we go on, uh, both Jen and I, we're, we're raising our hands here. Didn't see you, so very sorry. Please feel free to come forward. You go, Jen, first. Sure, I was just gonna mention um, that uh, yesterday I had emailed out that um, information sheet on improved funding for regional planning commissions and what it would take to fulfill our statutory obligations. Uh, so that you should all have in your inboxes. I am happy to address that when we get to um, the other business section of it, but it does kind of directly uh, respond to some of the things that just came up uh, within the, uh, Cordell's pr presentation and the discussion of RPCs playing a larger role. Thanks, Jen, and maybe um, we'll have time this morning that you can comment more fully, or if not, next week. Sure. And then just um, my Still comment, I'm sorry, my comment real quickly was, um, we're talking a lot about the education of land use boards, and I think that, uh, you know, we, we definitely want the Municipal Association to get on board, but I think one of my concerns is, if there is, um, if that does come to fruition, we need to just sign a sort of on the same track as that, really create a robust training that almost uh, is a certificate program so we know what the training is. We can't just say they need training and not know what that training is. It needs to be a specific program in my mind so that we know what every land use board member is going to need to accomplish. Um, you know, I just have sat on my side as a regional planning commission person, as well as on the local board side, um, assisting local board uh, folks. And it, we all, anyway, I have experienced where some board members always go to the to training and many more never go. And so it's what will we require of them and what will that look like? And I really think that before we say we require that, 
We need to have a specific program. Thank you. Sylvia, do you have some ideas of who should be creating that program um, so that it is consistent uh, and professional? Uh, and is that the job of the RPCs? Is that uh, working with the Municipal Association to um, actually construct um, an appropriate program? Uh, you know, that could be a multi-member board. Jen has an idea. Go, Jen. Sure, I was just gonna simply say that, I mean, that's part of what is already in the Office of Strategic Initiatives um, st uh, statutory responsibilities. So, I mean, that seems as a natural central hub to provide that um, training and service, but there are definitely many partners out there that could help supplement or further that reach, such as NHMA or the Regional Planning Commissions. So yeah, Noah, I mean, back sorry. in your bailiwick. Yeah, so we um, do provide a, you know, planning board basics, zoning board of adjustment, um, you know, basics and decision-making training at our annual conferences. I believe that is gonna be, um, there are gonna be those sessions at the uh, NHMA land use law conference happening on October 31st. Um, we have had, we are kind of gearing up to try to start um, putting together kind of more recorded webinars that could be viewed after the fact on those topics that I think would be kind of helpful and get at some of uh, kind of what you're saying of having more of a, a rigorous kind of program that everybody has to go through or that the resources are, resources are at least available for them to go through it if they want. So right. we are kind of moving in that, trying to move in that direction. So it seems to me when, when you're talking about webinars that what we're also doing is recognizing that there may be precipitant participants who don't come to the conference or, or who don't access in other ways, but that the communities themselves um, and their planning boards could um, access the information that would be in those webinars and um, share it with members of their planning board, members of the other land use boards and potentially the local residents um, as well. Uh, with maybe like a series of local presentations around land use issues uh, spun off from the webinars that you're creating. Is that a, a idea that you have? Is that how you think they might be used going forward? Yeah, I think there's definitely, I definitely see value in that. I mean, we are not from a capacity perspective, we're not in a position to give, to give local presentations um, I think if municipalities wanted to take our webinars, they could and kind of go kind of spin off something at the local level, that would be for them. But we OSI as six planners are just not in the position to be going and making local presentations. Um, we do get those requests. We just don't have the capacity, unfortunately. So, um, so Senator, Senator Clark, Clark? Yeah. Uh, the, the what we were coming down from the municipal so municipal committee was that this would take the form of uh, like a video training where the the, vi the video would be recorded uh, and then it would be uh, distributed out to the various municipalities and then the like the the uh, planning boards would would uh, uh, show that video at one of their meetings to be able so, so they could could get the video training so it would it would reduce the the uh, effort uh of the state to come down and do this but and it would be uh something that with if a planning board member was absent from that meeting they could very easily make up the training without again trying to tap resources or try to to, to spend time and money to go to a meeting and conquer it or whatever so th there were various ways to be to be that was discussed about how to minimize minimize the cost and effort of this training was it worked out as to um who would be creating those videos to begin with yeah it, it, was, it was the state uh but it was it was uh uh it was basically what we had talked about in terms of the state coming to do the training and just videotaping that effort and then just sharing the videotape 
So, uh, Noah, is, is it possible for OSI to create um, those videos or would so, you need a special so, grant or what? what would yeah, you, so you we, would uh, yeah, so we, we do have improved technology for whether we want to call them videos or recorded webinars or whatever to do that kind of thing now. And I, that is kind of gets back to, um, you know, what I said about kind of recording these planning board basics kind of, um, you know, webinar presentations. Um, you know, I do think it will take more of a concerted effort. It may take some additional additional resources, but it is within our wheelhouse and abilities to do so. And are there any that have already been created of these presentations? Um, not, yes and no in that, um, you know, the planning board and zoning board presentations um, from past conferences are up, um, just the PowerPoints. Um, the actual recordings of those presentations, no. Um, you know, we will have that from the NHMA conference this year with the Land Use Law Conference with that being virtual and it being recorded, um, which will definitely help. Um, but so kind of half and half is my answer. Um, so, so let me just follow up and ask you, um, do, is there an understanding of what might be the most relevant topics um, to focus these webinars on? Yes. So we, um, like I said, you know, the, the planning board and the zoning board um, kind of intro webinars go through all the nuts and bolts of what it takes to be on a planning board or a zoning board, what your statutory responsibility is, the kind of um, material that each board deals with, uh, the decision-making process for the ZBA, you know, the five kind of criteria for issuing um, variances, all that thing. So yes, we have a pretty detailed kind of um, curriculum. We've done these, the presentations have happened for years. So that is, that's pretty clear, yes. Okay, thank you very much. But if they're not I think Jen, I think Jen had her hand up again or Sylvia. Okay, again. Jen. No, I was just going to say um, what Noah touched upon is that the upcoming um, conference at the end of this month, the sessions will be pre-recorded. So it'd be lovely um, if that like great wealth of resources uh, would be available for on demand in the future. Terrific. Terrific. Okay. Um, Lorraine, thank you for your patience. We really look forward to hearing from you now. Thank you very much, Senator. It's um, my pleasure to be here. I was very, we uh, appreciate the invitation. Uh, I'll hold up a copy of the book here. Um, this is Communities and Consequences Two: Rebalancing New Hampshire's Human Ecology, which Peter Francis and I co-authored. The sequel to the, the book that we did, the first Communities and Consequences, on the unba unbalancing of New Hampshire's human ecology back about, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago now. Um, we also have a companion documentary film as we did with the first book uh, by Jay Childs from Exeter, which uh, Peter and I also assisted with. That is going to be making the debut on New Hampshire Public TV, PBS, um, on Thursday, October 22nd at 8 p.m. And I think when I, I was glad to hear Cordell talking about, we really need education for everyone, not just for board members and municipal leaders. And, and that's really what the three of us um, have been trying to do with these books and these, these films is to target not only those uh, leaders and, and board members, but also, you know, what concerned citizens, um, people in our towns and cities who, who care about uh, the community and, you know, have, are civic minded, if you will. Um, so with this book, we are following up on this, the demographic uh, sharp unbalancing that has, has only worsened in this last dozen years. Um, and it's, it's way worse than the national um, changes, you know, we have because of the aging of the baby boom and all that kind of stuff, we do have increases in older 
um, people in our population, as everyone's pretty aware. But in New Hampshire, it's way beyond that. Um, we have gone from being um, slightly younger than the average for the United States population back 20 years ago to now being the second oldest state. That's the second oldest me median age in the country. Number one happens to be Maine and number three is Vermont. So that is part of your answer as to, is this affecting other areas? Um, our region is especially um, hit by it. I think that, um, let me see, as an example, since 1990, the population of the United States has grown an average of 1.1% per year, while New Hampshire grew more slowly, just 0.8% per year. And during that time, 1990 to 2018, the number of residents age 55 or older increased 77% nationally but more than doubled in New Hampshire. And over that same period, the number of children under 18 in New Hampshire declined by 7%, while nationwide, the number of children increased 16%. And then, you know, the issue is, so, so what? Um, what? What this has really um, led to and contributed to is these very severe workforce shortages that we were, before the pandemic, we were experiencing in every single sector of this economy. Um, shortage of volunteers across all kinds of um, endeavors because of that shortage of, of working age population. And, and particularly in, in certain um, income levels for, jobs that are not the highest paying jobs. Um, and those many of those jobs are what we called essential workers during the pandemic. Um, I think we started to pay a little more attention to the people who, you know, uh, first responders to all kinds of healthcare workers and providers, the food, um, food service, food, the whole food chain system, people started, you know, when we had those shortages and things, people started to actually pay attention. Um, and these are the people who have the hardest time finding housing in New Hampshire. Um, some of the ones that we need the most. And the, and the great irony, which we really highlight in the book, is that we've had all this influx of, of really affluent um, seniors and they require a lot of services. And as they get older and less well, they require more services. And those, anyone who's had um, family members who, who required care or, um, you know, it, nursing homes, assisted living, things like that, um, home health aides, have a terrible time finding people who can do those jobs. Um, they and when you find them, they struggle with housing, reliable housing. They struggle with reliable vehicles for their long commutes that are necessitated by the high costs of housing. It really has become um, critical. But what we found going around the state um, is that now people are starting to recognize those issues and those problems and in some places are really trying to do something about it and and people are coming up with um, some creative and successful ways so so this book and this film really focus on um, what some of these communities are doing to improve the situation and we're hoping to inspire others um, and um, so some examples um, we have Lancaster using, uh, adopting a form-based code, which is you know, an innovative um, planning technique to revitalize their downtown. And it's a great example of, as all, all of these stories that we found 
really are intergenerational stories. This, I really want to stress, this isn't about bad, you know, good people and bad people or old people and young people. The, the, what we are focusing on is the need for balance um, that we all, we need each other, all different parts of the, the age range. And in Lancaster, you have a young town planner who grew up in the area who has made special efforts to include not only the seniors in the community, but also the teenagers in the planning, you know, planning process for, for master planning. They have high school representatives for their planning board. Um, and especially for this downtown work. We have uh, a lot of use of historic preservation, reuse and repurposing of, of old buildings in Lancaster, which has just enhanced the, the architectural and historic character of that town um, and provided more diverse housing. Heard that before, I think. Um, the downtown has a number of the, of the re, um, rehabilitated buildings have apartments on the, on the second and third floors and commercial and professional offices and things on the first floor, leading to a increasingly lively downtown. Um, great example in Lancaster is, is a gentleman named Greg Cloutier, who's a 70-year-old native of the area, who um, he, he says he was, he was lucky. He was able to um, go to college, in engineering, came back and and made a career, very successful career in industrial and hydropower engineering up there in the North Country um, when industry was thriving. And now his idea of retirement is to invest in his community. And he's taken on a series of, of uh, projects, building rehabilitation, restoration, and repurposing purposing of these buildings. He and his wife have gotten a Preservation Alliance Award for their work. Um, and they're currently working with the Nor Northern uh, Forest Center on the Parker J. Noyes building, which is another landmark up there in, in Lancaster. Um, but he really stresses uh, that it's the people that run the businesses that have come in um, that really really make make a community there and that it's the residential units that make the whole thing work in terms of the development and this is something a lot of our towns and cities had, had uh, zoned residential use in downtown areas out um, and he uh, he notes that it's it's those people coming into the, you know, living in the in the downtown, being around um, makes it lively, makes it look to businesses like, way hey, we might be able to have a going business in this location, and in turn, that makes it more desirable for people to live there. They have found young professionals as well as older people who want to downsize. Um, these apartments really appeal to. Um, you know, I think, I know that, that your commission has, has spent a lot of time on um, zoning restrictions and I imagine building code restrictions and it, and it sounds like water and sewer uh, infrastructure shortages. That's, those are, those are three of the big drivers of high cost of housing in New Hampshire communities um, and that all need addressing. Um, but there's also the, uh, the issue, I think, of myths and prejudices and, and attitudes that uh, some of you have, have um, spoken to here already this morning. A couple of the biggest myths are uh, that large lot size requirements, large minimum lot sizes are uh, somehow good for conservation, that they can serve 
land and open space and and nothing could be more wrong it's just the opposite um and and in fact i think people use that as an excuse for why they want the large lots but but um that just requires a lot of education um to get to get that out of people's heads in fact denser development allows you to conserve more land and more contiguous and valuable open space and natural resources. Um, we have uh, another, another myth is that somehow housing density, allowing um, more greater density for housing that is restricted in age to 55 and, and up, for example, um, is somehow a good thing and acceptable and practical, but any kind of increased density for housing for everybody else um, is not. Um, and I think that one is, is tied to the, the myth about schools costs and, and children, which just underlies so much of this. I, you know, there may be, um, uh, a shred of, of uh, truth to this old myth from back in the 1980s when some of our communities were growing so fast. I know my own town of Stratum in the seacoast, you know, more than doubled in size between 1980 and 1990, for example, and schools had to be built. But you know, the tax base grew too. <laughs> and, um, but I think that some, some people still have that sort of shell shock from the rapid development that occurred back then. But since then, as all of you know, um, development's been pretty, pretty slow. Population growth has been almost negligible. Um, so, and in fact, when you have underpopulated schools, the costs are greater, uh, certainly greater per pupil. So people do not see the savings that they think they were gonna see with having no children. And instead we have um, some high costs in not having, having children um, who do in fact become our future workers and, and leaders and taxpayers. Um, let's see. I, I think there's a lot of uh, fostering creativity and diversity is, is really important to this. We found you know, we talked to um, Will Stewart at Stay, Work, Play, and also Todd Fahey at um, New Hampshire ARP. And they, they joke with each other about how much they end up advocating for the same things before um, legislative committees and the like, uh, because so much of what appeals to the young also appeals to older residents. Um, walkable communities and um, smaller, more affordable houses and um, access to public transportation. A lot, a lot of those, um, and, and even um, community diversity. So it's, it, again, it's not a matter of um, being against older people it's a it's a matter of wanting to be inclusive and having having a balance of of all ages in the community um, i think as a great um um example <laughs> is uh pelham pelham is featured in both the book and the film they voted last march town meeting to eliminate any future age-restricted housing in town, having already had a lot built, and they were very disappointed with what the impact that it's had on the community. Um, they found it wasn't affordable for their, their own residents who were getting older and, and wanted to downsize, and instead were um, brought in an influx of, of uh, affluent out of state older people, um, many of whom then apply for favorable property tax, uh, you know, the senior property tax 
um, benefits, which is another, another way that we have put the thumb on the scale in favor of older people and at the expense of, of younger people. Um, great, we have some great stories like uh, in the Upper Valley where we feature how different groups and organizations and, and employers are working together to solve the really critical how workforce housing issues up there. And they're actually making some progress on that and doing some pretty innovative things. Um, Dartmouth Hitchcock Health, for example, building housing for employees, um, getting, getting that, that desperate. Um, so other great examples, not in the book because it's just popped into the newspapers here just in the last week or so. In, in Dover, um, a proposal for 40 um, plus cottage homes uh, on a um, um, on a relatively small parcel of, of land. Um, these are, are very small, uh, 384 square feet, plus a, a por small porch and a storage shed for each unit. They're going to be rental units and they're being developed by uh, a, a man who owns two assisted living homes in, in Durham and his architect wife. And because they have become so critically aware of the impact of the housing shortage on their workforce, uh, which tends to be <clears throat> young, he says 18 to 20 something, 30 year old um, workers just struggling to find stable housing. And um, this sounds like just the kind of creative um, provision for, for people to, to um, have their own independent um, but small modest home. That's an example of, of the creativity and, and uh, diversity. Town of Bradford, um, the group of young young twenty somethings came back to the town after going off to college and working and traveling around the world and all that kind of thing, and decided they wanted to put their roots down and formed the Kearsarge Food Hub, a nonprofit. Started a farm and a mar farmers market, and it has just become a a beehive, if you will, of, of activity. And um, again, it was young people started it, but it is really an intergenerational story where people of, of all ages in the community have really gotten involved and, and um, work together. And I, I just think it's, a, it's an example, as so many of the examples are that we write about in the book or feature in the, in the film, of uh, the true meaning of community. And uh, so I, I, I think there is hope, but um, it is going to require a lot of education and, and uh, we will never convince everybody. But um, a lot of it is, is uh, as one gentleman says in the film, it's, it's, it's a matter of showing up. Uh, somehow it's a lot more motivating when people are against something. When you get those uh, social media uh, campaigns to, to get out and and I'm sure all of you uh, legislators and senators <laughs> know, get on the receiving end of those. Um, people who are supportive tend to be quieter and, and not necessarily make the effort to get out and go to that planning board meeting or, or um, communicate to their, their legislator. But that's, that's what we need to really encourage people to, to act in positive ways. Um, so if you have any questions for me or uh, oh, I know that the film, uh, New Hampshire PBS is, is looking to schedule a legis special legislative screening virtually, of course, um, in January with the new, new legislature. So I, I hope that um, we'd get some support in, in uh, turning people out for that. I think you're, Senator Clark, you're, you're on mute. Okay. 
uh, I was saying I muted, I had a dog barking. Um, uh, how do people get uh, copies of this latest publication? Um, do you can, I think it's in all the independent bookstores in New Hampshire. Uh, it can also be, you know, gotten on Amazon and all those kinds of um, online things as well. Um, Delta, uh, Northeast Delta Dental has underwritten um, a copy for each public library in the state of New Hampshire. I think those have, they've either been mailed out or they will be very shortly. So every, every town and city library will have a copy. Well, I wanted also, thank you. I wanted also to mention that one of the things that was brought up in which your book will be helpful is that in this report that we're putting together or the information that we're collecting is that we do need um, to cite uh, uh, positive examples in communities that other people um, can look to and learn from. So I think we're very appreciative of so much of this publication really focusing on a community to community basis to learn from. Uh, and uh, I know, for instance, that in Belfast, Maine, there is an intergenerational housing community. I wonder if anyone has, has looked at that as a possible model for New Hampshire. I've, I've seen, um, you know, articles about about such communities in other states as well. And I, I think it's a, a, you know, very intriguing, wonderful idea. Um, I haven't heard of anyone exploring that specifically in New Hampshire. I don't know if anyone has from um, OSI or. Are there, are there que other questions for Lorraine from the commission members or others? Mark has his hand up. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank you for this. I know we've had Peter over at BEA come to our office, go over the original book and was telling us the process of this. Will Arbello in our office, who lives in Newfields, is very interested in and we're working with him to put together a big meeting with some CEOs that are interested in that. So I know BEA is something is we're looking at that. But I want to play devil's advocate here because as a former uh, um, elected official in my town, in my town, uh, being relatively affluent, but of average size and all that. We've got a lot of houses that go up on the market at numbers that I think are ludicrous and just crazy sales numbers. And they're gone in three days, a couple on our street. Um, and one of the things I once heard is about a year ago from an official, it's like people like the thought that their houses are worth a lot. And if they were to leave, they could make a lot of money from that. And they don't yeah. want anything that jeopardizes that. I'm playing devil's advocate here. When you hear that, how do you respond? You know, that's the other side of the, um, you know, what's going to happen to my tax bill if this development happens. I think you're right. I think increasingly there's a calculation amongst some homeowners that when there is a shortage of housing, it's the basic supply and demands of economics. That means that those of us who own a house are going to benefit from inflation and values and you know, and too bad for the ones who can't afford to buy them. I, that's that's a, um, I, I don't know how we get around that other than really trying to emphasize and, and speak to the, the better angels amongst amongst us and, and the more positive values, which I, I hope is what our book and film um, do in terms of highlighting people that are, are working together to, um, um, make progress in, in this area and, and that show concern for others in the community besides themselves and their own net worth or something. I, you know, some of it's human nature and we'll never um, elim eliminate all of it, but I, um, you know, but you're, you're spot on, I think in terms of, and this pandemic has not helped for, for many communities in New Hampshire and, and other parts of New England um, have become escape meccas for people from the cities who have money, and I, I, you know, I keep hearing from uh, realtors in Exeter that you know we have people calling up and buying houses over the phone, sight unseen, for more than what the asking price was, and you know. Yeah, just as an example, the five houses around me that went for sale this year, three have Massachusetts plates in their driving way, one has Rhode Island. Yes. Um, and you know, that's again, 
the more more need for for the types of, of housing that are, are going to be um, priced lower and maybe not not as appealing to people like that but yeah I just asked that question because to me that is maybe the biggest question to ask, answer because I think it's the hardest one to answer and it's yeah. the one I hear in my town of 4,000 so, Lorraine, if I could, if I could add, this is just a reminder of the um, the webinar that uh, New Hampshire Housing is hosting on Thursday, uh, the 15th at at 10 a.m. Uh, that gets to this very question, uh, and it is a presentation by Joe Minicosi of Urban Three um, on a, analysis of 15 communities across New Hampshire, uh, looking at different types of development and their uh, land value analysis uh, and the the, um, the the data speak for themselves. So to, to Mark's point about you know what people want, they want value in, in their property. What is going to get the greatest value and what's going to maintain the greatest value is not large lot single family zoning, but rather more dense development with this, the stuff that Lorraine you're talking about in Lancaster. You're right because um, you know when when you see this workforce shortage situation, as that gets worse and worse, that's going to detract from the uh, desirability of our communities. When, when you can't get the services, when you can't get the care, um, it, it, it will become, but, but that's a hard, it's a bit of a hard sell to get people to look, look ahead like that. So, so two comments I would make is, one is the issue about where are one's children and grandchildren going to live? Thank um, you. <laughs> and I think um, that's a key question to pose over and over again. So you're going to get maximum value for selling your house at a high price. But what are the ramifications on a family to family basis? Uh, and Ben, I wanted to ask you, are you sending a link to everybody so that they can participate in that presentation tomorrow? have and I will again it's on uh, Thursday it's on Thursday okay and it's at what time 10 a.m. 10 a.m. okay just I think we're, Peter and I are presenting to the New Ham leadership New Hampshire Thursday morning at that time Ben otherwise I'd love if you have any um, information you can share afterwards that would be great sure and we will record it too you, you will record it because I think there's also an energy conference that morning at the same time, unfortunately. But we'll, you know, everything is piling up on everything else. So um, this has been great conversation, great discussion today. Ben, could you um, just think about, we talked about having a developers forum um, and is that viable for the next time we meet or not? I believe it is. Um, I need to confirm with the speakers, but um, if it, I'll, I'll leave it to you, Senator. If, if you feel like we need to focus on the report, um, we can do that, or we can also do a developer panel. I think everyone wants to hear from the developer. I will um, hopefully, I started working on it this past weekend, have a draft of the report that can be shared with everyone by next week and then we can have a discussion um, the following week and maybe Ben in the interim you and I can have a discussion about what you think is important to include in the report. Sure, thank you. Okay, um, then the only other thing was we never did hear as I remember from Professor England about his update on schools um, and do you think that's possible or do people want that or can we just get the data to reference in our report and then going forward? Anyway, something to think about. Uh, and then the, the final question is, um, I think when we do have the discussion is again, coming back to this notion of um, being able to reference communities that have successfully navigated the affordable housing, workforce housing, low income housing challenge. So I think we need to go. So that's another. I just connected there for a second. Okay, thanks. Bye bye.
Bye-bye. So, so, oh, so Senator, we need to just take a roll call to end the meeting. Oh, we have a roll call to end the meeting. May we have a roll call? Senator, I move we adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All in favor by roll call, please. Uh, Matt Leahy. I vote yes. To Andrew adjourn. Haddock. Andrew Haddock, aye. Representative Folio. Aye. Noah Hodgetts. Aye. Marco Liberty. Aye. Jen Sizz. Aye. Keith Tebow. Aye. Representative Dolan. He left. I think we lost him. Uh, ben Frost votes aye. Senator? I vote aye. It's unanimous. Thank you all very, very much. See you next.